Imagine a video shot on one of those highly pixelated Nokia cameras from the early 2000s. A blurry video with indistinguishable faces and fuzzy audio. In 2012, far in the northern hills of Pakistan, in a small district called Kohistan, a video just like this was circulating. This video to an outsider was innocent. Four women clapping and singing wedding songs while a boy dances to their melodious tunes. It sounds like a happy moment caught on a 2 megapixel camera. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. This is the story of that video. A video that cost nine people their lives. This is the story of the Kohistan video murders. Flanked by tall snowy mountains, Kohistan is a district in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region of northern Pakistan. The region is accessed by the Khyber Pass, which connects India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But the beautiful frigid mountains of the region don't tell the whole story of this district. Not only is there a geographic change as you travel the 350 kilometers from Islamabad to Kohistan, there's a visible change in culture. And that change is frightening. As you approach Kohistan, the number of women visible on the streets steadily decreases. And by the time you reach Kohistan, the place where this entire case is based, no woman can be seen on the street. So, of course, there have to exist the women in Kohistan for the men to exist unless reproduction works differently here, which I assume it doesn't. So, where are the women? That's a fair question. Women in Kohistan aren't allowed to leave their homes. They work either in their fields or stay inside their homes. Women leaving their homes is seen as blasphemous. In the spring of 2012, phones in Kohistan were pinging left and right with an MMS, which is usually a photo or a video. This was before the era of AirDrop, Google Drive or viral TikToks. This particular MMS was a video that was shot a year earlier in a small room at a local wedding. It was an innocent video, a celebration really. The video features four women, Begum Jan, Shireen Jan, Baziga and Amna, with the fifth woman Shaheen also involved but not featured in the video. They are singing, dancing and clapping to wedding songs. A normal video that any of us would be accustomed to. But this one seemingly normal video led to deadly consequences. Okay, so I'm confused, Aryan. What exactly is the story here? Why would a video and MMS ever lead to deadly consequences in any universe? For that, Ashwara, you will need a bit more context. The video was recorded on a phone by a man from Kohistan named Bin Yasser. His brother, Gul Nazar, was the man dancing to the melodious tunes of the women in the video. I will call a spade a spade here and call Kohistan what it is, a hyper-conservative patriarchal society. Even though Gul Nazar was performing a traditional dance in traditional clothing, the fact that unmarried men and women were in the same room together repulsed the people of Kohistan. This grainy video infuriated the sexist society. As soon as this video surfaced in Kohistan in March 2012, five women were identified and eventually kidnapped. The kidnappers were none other than the women's own family members. This was the beginning of what would become Pakistan's most infamous honor killing, rife with assassinations, lies and politics. An honor killing is when a family member murders another member because they believe they have brought shame or dishonor to their family or has violated the principles of a community or a religion. In this case, members of the women's family said they had brought dishonor to their family name. And while honor killings are rampant all across South Asia, Pakistan has the highest number of documented and estimated honor killings per capita of any country in the world, with a staggering 1,000 official killings every year. Before I continue, Ashwara, please feel free to chime in whenever I'm talking about sexism in Kohistan. I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to not be able to leave your house at all. And I know you haven't grown up in a place as dire as Kohistan, but I do know you've you know, experienced your fair share of sexism. Yeah, I don't think I've ever experienced anything close to Kohistan's level of you can't leave your house at all, there are no women on the streets level of sexism. But I think it's a common female experience in South Asian countries to not be able to leave your house at a specific time, to not be able to wear certain clothes outside of your house. So I think to that part and how we feel, all women can relate. 
It was May 2012 when the five women involved in the grainy video were kidnapped. After being held captive in a room for a few days, the kidnappers held a jirga, a quasi-legal tribal council. Male elders heading up the jirga were tasked with deciding the fate of the women and of Bin Nasir and Gul Nasir, the two brothers involved with the video. In Kohistan, the jirga's decision has the equivalence of a ruling by the United Nations Security Council. It's binding. With little chance of reconciliation, the two brothers decided they would try to make an escape. Unlike the five women being held hostage, Yasir and Nazir were free and still had a chance to traverse the hills of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to freedom. Whispers about the Jirga's decision spread across Kohistan, and even before the elder's judgment was delivered, the two brothers had escaped the region. Nowhere to be found. And Yasser and Nazir weren't the only people to escape Kohistan. Several people directly related to the brothers also fled Kohistan in a bid to save their lives. They left behind ancestral homes, large farmlands, and their own history. The only ones left who could answer to the video were the five women still alive, but with no chance of escape, unless someone dared to stand up. Afsal was Yasser and Nazar's older brother and knew that once the Jirga made a decision, it was impossible to escape it. Afsal also cared for the five girls. Although his two younger brothers were able to escape Kohistan, the girls were not so lucky. In the same month the video leaked to the public, the Jirga made their decision the girls were to be put to death. Being held captive in a small room, death seemed to them like the better option. Family members tortured the girls, pouring boiling water on their skin and throwing hot coals at them. Afsal decided to take action. He reported the Jirga and the girls' family to the police, but he soon realized contacting the local authorities was futile. And so he took the first step that stirred the pot. He drove south 250 kilometers to Abbottabad, a city in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. There, he arranged a press conference. <laughs> Televised on news channels all across Pakistan, Afsal protested the death sentence levied on the girls and his brothers. It was a maniacal scene. That night, on June 4, 2012, Afsal's story from Kohistan spread like wildfire. But unfortunately, it was too late. Having endured 30 days of captivity and torture, on May 30th, 2012, four days before the press conference, the five girls, Begum Jan, Shireen Jan, Baziga, Shaheen, and Amna, were killed. But what I'm about to say, Shwarya, might surprise you. The Supreme Court of Pakistan organized a task force within hours of Afsal's press conference, just a matter of hours, when everyone thought that this would be just another story of failed justice and bureaucracy. Credit to Pakistan's Supreme Court for quick and decisive action. On June 5th, the Chief Justice of Pakistan demanded that the Commissioner of Kohistan present the girls to him in Islamabad. Kohistan's police commissioner told the court that the girls were alive, but that they wouldn't bring them to the capital. People in Kohistan were confident that no one from Islamabad would dare travel the treacherous hills to investigate the honor killing. The people of Kohistan justified not presenting the girls in Islamabad as part of their tradition. The family of the girls argued that it was disrespectful and dishonorable to have women in a court. But the justice system of Pakistan wasn't willing to fall prey. It ordered then Interior Minister Rahman Malik to go to Kohistan to see if the girls were still alive. On top of all of this judicial action because of Afsal's press conference, discussions about the legitimacy of Jirgas had already been heating up in the Pakistani judicial system. On the same day the Chief Justice demanded he see the girls from Kohistan's police commissioner, the Supreme Court was set to adjudicate a case on the legality of Jirga proceedings. The Commission on Status of Women, or CSW, lobbied to outlaw Jirgas, claiming they were remnants of a patriarchal culture with no legal bearing. Female activists from the commission were in court in Islamabad that day, unaware that an investigation in Kohistan was underway that would change their lives forever. All of the women from the CSW had gathered for the hearing on Jirgas, but very quickly they became aware of the happenings in Kohistan. The Chief Secretary of Pakistan was quick to act. 
he ordered the then interior minister Rehman Malik to go to Kohistan and to take some of the female activists with him. As Rehman Malik was exiting the court building, he spotted Dr. Farzana Bari, a well-known women's rights activist, and requested she come along. Dr. Bari was surprised by the request. Nobody visited the remote districts of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, let alone to investigate a murder. But she couldn't say no. Other women also accompanied Dr. Bari. They were given just one hour to bring along sweaters and blankets before meeting in front of the Islamabad Marriott Hotel to head into the mountains of Kohistan. Honestly, I am surprised by how quickly all of this has happened. Not just the fact that the court adjudicated on this case the very next day, but also the fact that they dispatched an entire task force within hours. That bodes really well for the investigation and unfortunately that's counterintuitive to what I had assumed. I couldn't agree more, Ashwara, but... Acting swiftly was a prerequisite. If they didn't act swiftly, it would give time to people in Kohistan, the families and the complicit authorities, to stage a fake Kohistan. So Dr. Bari knew if they were ever going to find the truth, they had to act now. And I think I'd be remiss to point out, Ishwara, but Islamabad to Kohistan is an insanely treacherous journey. Mm. It's a very hilly terrain. In fact, when the pilot of the helicopter was flying from Islamabad to Kohistan, it is reported that he was chanting prayers out loud <laughs> wow. because there have been several helicopter crashes in this region. Mm. And although the helicopter landed safely, what the group discovered at Ground Zero was harrowing. Most people Dr. Bari and other investigators met in Kohistan said their sister or wife or mother or someone they know had been killed for honour. One investigator said honour killings were as common as the common cold. But they knew they had to remain unfazed. Their mission was clear. Find if the girls were safe. The women requested that the local authorities provide them with photographs of the missing girls. Neither Rahman Malik nor Dr. Bari had seen any of the girls before, so they needed photographs to verify their identities. It wasn't all too surprising when the authorities denied the request. Dr. Bari and her team had to come up with a solution. They decided to reach out to the Aurat Foundation, a non-profit advocacy group for women based in Islamabad. They told them to capture stills of the girls from the infamous video. And back in 2012, it wasn't as simple as just taking a screenshot. So this sort of request was going to take some time. The next day, the investigators set out to find the girls. But everything was stacked against them. No one in the group spoke the Kohistani dialect and their translator was issued by the local authorities. Accompanying the investigators was Maulana Javed, who allegedly issued the Jirga's decision, also known as a fatwa. Dr. Bari and the group walked for hours uphill only to find abandoned houses. Pointing to a distant hill, Maulana Javed said the families had shifted to higher ground for the summer and that it would be impossible to get there on foot. The task force was determined, however, so they continued to journey on. After walking some more, a girl was finally called from one of the houses. The girl was draped in red clothes and alleged her name was Amna, one of the girls who was in the video. Amna told investigators that the video wasn't shot at a wedding and it was the mother of the brothers, Yasir and Nazir, who asked the girls to come into their house for a chat. She revealed the girls didn't know they were being filmed at all. I, for one, absolutely do not believe that. Uh, I have my reasons to not believe that, but why do you think so? So if anyone notices the video carefully, it's obvious that Nazar, the boy that's recording the video, isn't hiding the camera. He's staring into the camera directly. He's moving it towards his brother's face. He's flaunting it at the girls. It's impossible to do all of that while also concealing the phone. Well, that is what Amna had to say. While the investigators in Kohistan didn't have any scientific way of proving the girl was actually Amna, they cross-compared the girl's facial features with the photo eventually sent to them by the Aurat Foundation. Dr. Bari and others concluded that it was Amna. The eyes, the nose and face structure matched that of the video. In fact, she was actually wearing the same clothes she wore in the video. The task force proceeded, trying to find the whereabouts of the other girls, Begum, Shireen and Bazika. The translator pointed towards three different distant hills as the location of each of the other missing girls. At this point, it was getting late and the task force had to return to Islamabad. 
Local authorities had refused to let the group stay in Kohistan for longer than a day. Upon reaching Islamabad, the group reported to the Supreme Court that Amna was alive, but they couldn't verify the status of the other three girls. Although it was incredible that Amna was found alive, it was puzzling. Afsal claimed that Amna and the four other girls were dead. Was Afsal lying? But if so, why? Maulana Javed, the man who Afsal claimed was responsible for the girls' deaths, alleged that Afsal and his brothers twisted their story because they were waiting to file for asylum in the US to leave Pakistan. After the first task force mission to Kohistan, a week later on June 16th, another group went into the mountains, better equipped and knowing what to look for. This second task force comprised of Dr. Farzana Bari, politician Bushra Gohar, and Justice Munira Abbasi. This time around, the group had security and guaranteed translators. When the task force arrived, the investigators were presented with three women. But despite having more time to prepare, the commission still wasn't ready. The group didn't receive their promised translators from the authorities and instead were given a relative of the girls to translate, not exactly the most unbiased person available. The three girls were questioned, photographed and fingerprinted, but Dr. Bari was not satisfied. Five girls were killed for honour. Dr. Bari insisted on seeing Bazika, one of the girls in the video. When the task force first went to Kohistan, the authorities had refused, and even during the second visit they made up excuses, arguing that Baziga was pregnant and couldn't meet with the group. In a matter of a week, the authorities' excuse went from she's too far to she's too pregnant. <laughs> Dr. Bari wasn't one for these excuses, but her demands went unheard. The person leading the task force, Justice Munira, was convinced with the evidence the group had already gathered and was eager to return back to Islamabad. Dr. Bari refused to fly back, telling the authorities she planned to stay another night to make the journey to Baziga's house the next day. The authorities said if she decided to stay, she was staying at her own risk. Dr. Bari knew she couldn't stay in Kohistan without protection, and to her dismay, returned back to Islamabad with the other two female investigators. On June 20th, the Supreme Court of Pakistan, under the guidance of Justice Munira, the lead investigator, marked the case closed. The Chief Justice did take Dr. Bari's concerns into account. In his verdict, he included an option to reopen the case if new evidence came to light. And did it? Boy, did new evidence come up. On January 4th, 2013, Afsal's three brothers who stayed back in Kohistan were killed by the girl's family. Their house was raided and bombarded with bullets. But the three brothers weren't even the ones involved in the video. The case was reopened. Okay, so a bit of housekeeping here. What's the evidence that we have so far? As far as I recall, there's a clear relationship between the assassins of Afsal's three brothers and the girl's tribe. We know that there's an ambivalence in Kohistan whenever the question to present the girls in court is brought up, which nudges one to further investigate. There is Afsal's testimony, there is witness evidence of a fatwa, and as tantalizing and convincing as these pieces are to me personally, I don't know if they're legally enough. Is there something that I'm missing? There's just one thing you're missing, one thing that the investigators, the police, the political pundits, everyone missed. If this one piece of evidence was found, the case would be solved. And the answer to this million dollar question lay in the hands of a Reuters journalist. A few days after his press conference in 2012, Afsal walked into the Reuters office in Islamabad. He was looking for someone who could help him push his case through the courts. There, in the dusty halls of the newsroom, he met Catherine Herald, the news organization's former Afghanistan and Pakistan correspondent. She immediately formed a bond with Afsal and was out on a mission to get justice for the girls. When they first met, Afsal slowly, with the help of a friend who spoke slightly better English, laid out the facts of the case to Catherine. Five women and his two brothers had made a light-hearted film of themselves clapping and singing to music in the remote northern valley where they lived. The grainy footage showed the women sitting down, headscarves on, occasionally clapping. Even though Catherine wasn't Pakistani, she was a woman who lived in Pakistan. 
She wasn't a stranger to honor killings and she knew about the destitute conditions women were subjected to in the country. Around 1,000 so-called honor killings were reported each year and that was just the ones that made it into the press. My binder was crammed with cases of women pounded to death, girls strangled, pregnant women shot, sisters and daughters drowned and beaten. In regards to the prevalence of honor killings, Catherine said, honor killings were so common, several each day we could rarely cover them. When someone told me their sister and mother had been raped and set on fire by the landlord, I said I couldn't even write a story about it. Too frequent, couldn't get it past the desk. But there was something about the Kohistan case that drew Catherine's attention. There was just something about the case that promised a glimmer of justice perhaps, a shot at equality, at hope. So after Rafsal and Catherine's meeting, the duo spent months and then years trudging around Pakistan's capital of Islamabad, knocking on the doors of civil society organizations that could help. Although the case in Kohistan was initially taken seriously by the country's legal system, the judicial department's progression started to slow and public upheaval settled. As months passed, instead of Afsal's appeal picking up momentum, rumours against Afsal started to spread. When the second task force declared the case shut, Afsal didn't know what to do. But herein came Catherine Hurald, who realised there was only one way to shift the direction of the case. The second commission that was sent to Kohistan was presented four girls, who they took headshots of. Catherine was able to access those pictures, but more importantly, an anonymous witness from Kohistan shared with Catherine the NADRA cards of the girls. NADRA, the National Database Registration Authority, is an identification agency in Pakistan that issues national identification cards similar to Aadhaar card in India or a driver's license in America. These NADRA cards had the pictures and fingerprints of Begum, Shireen and Amna. This was it. Now they could compare the photos of the actual girls with the photos of the alleged girls and they wasted no time. On a cursory glance of the photos, Catherine noticed something in Begum's Nadra photo. Begum had a small raised mole an inch above her left lip. In the commission's photo, Begum had a mole, but it was flat and in a slightly different position on her face. Okay, so I'm guessing a mole isn't sufficient evidence to prove anything. Maybe a more comprehensive analysis can help, but I know I'm jumping the gun. Also, if there were five girls, why just three cards? Great question. So, firstly, to have a NADRA card made, mm -hmm. you need to be over 18. And one of the girls, Shaheen, was under 18. As for the second girl, the card was just never found. But to the more important thing, the comprehensive analysis of the photos. Catherine and Afsal needed something way more substantial and persuasive to try and shift the momentum. So they sent pictures of the girls from the NADRA cards, pictures from the second commission, and even pictures from the original video for analysis. All three sets of pictures were sent to a British intelligence agency for facial recognition analysis. Basically, Ashwara, if you've ever been at the airport and they cross-analyze your face with the one in your passport, yeah. that's basically what they were doing here. When Catherine received the facial recognition analysis, the results were jarring. Begum's picture from a NADRA card compared to a photo taken by a local villager had a 49.5% match, which meant there was an extremely high probability it was the same person. But when the NADRA photo was compared with the commission's photo from their trip, the results were a deal breaker. 17.4%. One could conclusively say that the woman Dr. Bari and other investigators met during their trip was definitely not Begum. The two other girls' NADRA photos were also found to be mismatched. There was only one plausible explanation as to why that could have been. All the girls were dead. Using this evidence, Afsal submitted a writ to the district court in Kohistan on February 12, 2014, demanding the girls be presented again to compare their fingerprints. The judge ordered the tribe to present the girls, but they denied. Again, and again, and again. Their argument remained the same. It wasn't in their culture to present girls in court. Afsal wrote to the Supreme Court asking whether they planned to look at the girls' fingerprints. They waited, but Catherine grew impatient. She wrote to the court asking for an interview, but when they didn't respond, she decided to go there and ask in person. 
The registrar looked at me with tired eyes from between tottering piles of paper, carefully transcribed heartbreaks screaming from the guts of each folder. He didn't say much. Even after the fortitude of evidence, no court date was set. Now the tide had completely turned for the worse. Media pressure faded, political backing of Afsal withered, public outcry dimmed, lawyers became too expensive and Afsal stood alone. On a random morning in 2017, even more heartbreaking news appeared. The six men sentenced to life in prison for the assassination of Afsal's three brothers were acquitted. By now, years had passed since the blurry video of the girls was filmed on a Nokia phone. It was time for Catherine to start another chapter in her life, to move away from the story that seemingly went nowhere. She moved to Kenya but kept in contact with Afsal. But Afsal didn't give up. He lobbied the police, approached the courts and did everything he could. On March 7, 2019, in Abbottabad, Afsal had to go to a court hearing. He despised going to court hearings. They never seemed to lead to anything. At 10 past 8 in the morning, Afsal Kohistani was gunned down on the streets of Abbottabad. The next day's newspapers were headlined, Afsal from the Kohistan scandal shot dead. With Afsal dead, nobody was fighting for the girls. Bin Nasir and Gul Nazar are still in hiding. And Catherine has not only lost a source, but a friend. I was sad and angry. I was angry with all the people who failed him, who hadn't returned his calls and messages, who were honour-bound and bloody well paid to support him in this fight and who had chosen to watch from the sidelines. I was mad I didn't try harder to write his story and for the many times I hadn't chatted with him because I was busy. I'm sad he won't marry and have children to heal a family so devastated by killing. I was sad that Pakistan, once a much-loved home and land of my friends, failed him. I was sad to think that he was one of many who died in vain. I'm sad that I won't see his bright white smile again. Afsal, my friend, you deserved better than this. Your spirit was strong and patient and you never stopped fighting. Yet as so many times before, I have nothing to give you but words. But most disappointing of all, Afsal never got to see justice served. In September 2019, just months after he was assassinated, the brother of Begum Jan, the father of Shireen Jan, and the father of Baziga were sentenced to life in prison for the murder of three of the five women. I'm reminded of something Afsal said after the death of his brothers. He said that now his life could be sacrificed too as long as justice was delivered, as long as his story was out there. This was Afsal's story. The man who tried to find justice, who fought for those who no one would fight for. His fight against all odds is the only reason we have justice to this day. But let's not forget, two women and his two brothers are still searching for justice. Who is meant to fight for them? The only answer is us.